Look. Greetings. I am Dr. Errol Bolden, professor in the Department of Social Work in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences here at Coppin State University, as well as the chair of the African American History Month Committee. Each year, we at Coppin follow the theme selected by the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. This year's theme is the Black Family, Representation, Identity, and History. In responding to this theme, the committee has planned a variety of activities to enhance our knowledge of Black history and to celebrate it. Please feel free to visit our website at www.coppin.edu backslash Black History Month for details and updates. For our opening activity, the committee decided that we would contact our president, um, Dr. Anthony Jenkins, to see if we could impress on him to allow us to interview our first family as our opening activity for our month's celebrations. And they graciously accepted our request. I thank you. Dr. Jenkins, please introduce your lovely family. Well, thank you, Doc. First and foremost, let me uh, thank you and the committee uh, for not only putting on what I know is going to be a wonderful Black History Month uh, for us here at uh, Coppin State, but also for the invite to uh, have the first family come and participate and uh, kick things off. And so, uh, as I've talked about many times since I've been here, my family, who I am extremely proud of, I'll start with our first lady, uh, Toinette, Hi. over here, and I will then move over to my oldest daughter, Ashley, Hi. and Hi. my youngest daughter, Alicia. And so uh, this makes up our, our first family. We also have the, the first dog, AJ, uh, who's running around somewhere. He, he may or may not make an, an appearance. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's also a part of the uh, family as well, as well as a turtle and a rabbit. So uh, it's almost like Dr. Doolittle in here, so, but it's, it is a pleasure to be with you. So it seems a um, pleasure for you to, um, to have you join us. It seems like you have a growing family. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's read right um, to the questions. And this first question I would pose to both um, you, President Jenkins, and uh, Mrs. Jenkins. How would you define the Black family, and why is it so important for us to celebrate Black family life? That's an excellent question. Um, you know, I would define the, the Black family um, as really an important nucleus to the African American community. Um, to the African-American ideals, um, to um, past and uh, uh, current and present generations. Um, you know, the African-American family has for so often um, been seen as something other than um, loving and committed, um, nurturing, uh, and I believe that's what the you know black family is. That's the black black family that I grew up in, uh, raised by a, a single mother. Um, but it is important, I, I think, for us to continue to know that that image of the black family evolves over time, and it is a it is a beautiful thing. It is a it is a multicultural aspect. Uh, and, and so all of those those factors, I think, are very important when you talk about how do we define our black family uh, and how important it is. Um, uh, those are some of the, the, the points that come to mind to me and that I would say that that are pretty important. Let me let me ask uh, Toinette to chime in and, and see what her thoughts may be on that. Perfect. Um, I think that's a great question as well. I, I see the black family as 
a firm foundation with its support based in love, understanding, and nurturing. You know, there's so many external factors that are already vying to undermine the Black family unit. And so celebrating Black family life to me is crucial. It helps to establish what I call that home base um, where, where that family unit feels supported and cared for and just free to be themselves. And, and so as you establish that home base, then I think, and you celebrate each other, you know, the successes as well as, you know, being able to learn from each other. I think then it allows each other to be free to go out into society to give of themselves as well as to give to other people that which they cultivated at home. Good. Um, um, thank you. The next question I have for you, you um, both of you again, is have either of you had to adjust to intergenerational differences in your intermediate, immediate or extended family? Any adjustment to those inter intergenerational differences? You know, I, I'll, I'll say that um, when I was younger, uh, Doc, I, I've always been in tune with um, having discussions with my grandmother and, and her brother, my, my uncles, uh, my uncle who uh, fought in Vietnam and my grandfather who fought in World War II. Um, I, was, I was always trying to learn from them. Right, always seeking what insight, what advice they, they, they had. And I would often ask my, my grandmother who was born in 1921 uh, to kind of talk to me about what the world was like and what she had seen over her lifetime. And that was always a fascinating conversation for me. Um, and then so uh, I've, I've embraced that uh, because I've always for as, as long as I can recall, been of the of the mindset that education is ubiquitous, that knowledge is is important, and that you can learn from any and everyone. And so I wanted to absorb as much from them, uh, which helped me develop into the person I am today. And so when I then look at it from me to my to my daughter's perspective, you know, I'm the I'm the cool dad. So. <laughs> You know, I, mean, I like their, their their music. We 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 dance and sing. We do all those type of things, and I I think that's important because I always want them to be in a position to know that I'm not just their father. I'm their friend, mm -hmm. uh, and that they can come to me and we can talk about anything across generational you know lines and uh, so forth. And I understand the world they're dealing with today is different than what I had to deal with. Um, but I also think learning from my past, uh, I understand the importance of being that individual who can make himself exposable to them. And so those those are just some of the you know lessons I've learned. And so I've not had too much of a, of a challenge with any generational changes or shifts and so forth. Uh, Twilight, what would what would you say? I, I echo. Um, what Anthea said as well, as far as uh, sitting at the knees of my dad, listening to stories about, um, you know, different family members and, and listening to my mom and grandmothers and aunts, you know, so one thing that comes to mind is that life quote that says that, that I live by is you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to listen. And so constantly keeping that in the forefront when, you know, you do have uh, disagreements and things that come up, it's a matter of just sitting down and listening to one another. Now, now Doc, let me, let me, let me throw this in because I, because I definitely want to be clear now. Every generation has those growing pains, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm quite sure when, when my grandmother was, was raising my mother, uh, you know, my grandmother didn't truly appreciate Motown and the Temptations and Marvin Gaye and all of that stuff. That was not of her of her era, so that took some getting used to, right? The different styles of dress, the different language, those things, and that's going to continue to happen, in my opinion, throughout generations. I think what is important is that we possess the the ability 
to keep our minds as open as our eyes, to listen and to see how we encourage and support and take the lessons we've learned to help that next generation become more tolerant and, and better at what they do in moving our nation and world forward. Mm -hmm. Ashley, is your dad a good dancer? No, don't, don't <laughs> answer. That might affect you, um, your allow any allowance you may <laughs> you may get. Let me let me bring the um, young ladies into the conversation for a little while before continuing with with the um, adults. This question is I'm posing to both of you. What is your favorite family tradition, and um, why? Why is it your favorite family tradition? What is it and why? Hang on, I'm, okay. um, I think my favorite, my favorite family tradition is when we go to uh, uh, a ski resort before Christmas because, um, you know, it, we're all together and it's like, it's really fun to spend more time with each other. I would say mine, it's, I guess it's kind of a new tradition that we do where we play board games or card games. I take Friday and Saturday. It's really a fun experience because we're all so competitive <laughs> and we all want to win. So it's like really fun to see how it turns out and how we like a little scoreboard that we have. It's so fun. Who always wins? Mommy. I see the one that was um, coming across as shy. She is no longer shy, um, has that shy persona. Uh, listen, listen. She is not shy, is she? You should hear how I get it on a daily basis, all right? So, no, there, there, there's no shyness amongst the girls. I wonder where they got it from. <laughs> let's, let's move on to, to another um, question. And again, this question is for um, both President and Mrs. Jenkins. What paradigm shifts have you had to make to effectively respond to contemporary family life. What 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 shifts have, have we had to make? Yes, because as you pointed out, you know, obviously each generation has their own um, style. I'll take it. Yeah. I, I think, you know, realizing we don't know it all, you know, so we're constantly, you know, when we realize that there is some shift, some friction is realizing how can we learn from this situation? Um, to better our family unit, to continue to cultivate it and nurture it so that we're progressively moving forward. So I think just having that open mind, would you say? Yeah, you know, I, I, would, I would add on that, um, you know, as I, as I talked about earlier, when we talk about the, the Black family and the, the contemporary shifts that we see today, um, you know, the, the actual Black family is not always all Black. Right. And so we 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 have black families that now are interracial, uh, that are blended families. Uh, you have stepchildren, uh, you have bi biracial children and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I think as as that nucleus changes and our environment changes, I think it's important for our perception and our understanding and our expectations to also uh, change. Um, we 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 have to be agile in that in that front. You know, back in the in the you know 30s, 40s, 50s, and uh, 60s, um, uh, the 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 African American family. I think there was this this very consistent perception of what that looked like, um, and that has obviously changed. And I think that change is good. I think that uh, we can continue to learn, as Twinette indicated, we can continue to grow um, and expand our tolerance on, you know, even though our families may not ethnically or uh, 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 blendedly look the way they, they have historically, for the for the uh, most part, um, I, I think there is value in understanding that the core value and the diaspora of the African American family is something that transcends anything. Mm -hmm. We are a powerful nucleus, and we influence so much. 
Uh, and so uh, the actual con contemporariness of it, in my opinion, adds value to something that is already beautiful. Good, good, good. Let's go back to the um, young ladies. We were frozen for a little while, but um, I think we are okay. back online. What is your favorite family holiday and why? Let's go to the shy one first. Who I'm going to let you um, determine who is who of the two who is the would be described as the shy one. Yeah. Uh, Alicia Barry. Alicia's the shy one. <laughs> so, what would be your favorite holiday? Um, my favorite holiday is Christmas because um, all of our family is there, and um, it it's just like it's. <laughs> um, I'd say it's a very fun time at Christmas to be honest it's so like all of our family comes together and there's like laughter and talking and then food it's just we go to watch football games we play games in general and it's, it's so fun to just see all of our family come together at that time of year and just be happy all together no gifts oh yes and gifts <laughs> <laughs> and Christmas gifts That's I was was a little surprised that um, the gifts didn't um, read its way into into that conversation. Okay, let me just continue um, with you. Um, what is the best advice your parents have given you? Um, it's really hard to decide which one because they give us so much advice. But I think one that stuck with me is the most famous person was once a beginner. So if you see someone that you look up to, even though they, when you watch them, they may seem like they do everything perfectly. They were once like you, they didn't know how to do anything, but they kept at it and they kept learning. So when you hit like a rock, you just try to work your way through it and you will eventually get through it. I think that's something that stuck with me. Spokesperson for the family, Bam. <laughs> But, but look, I'm, 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 I'm trying to get dad of the year. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Alicia? Um, I think she really gave some good advice, what, what they would say to us. But I think um, my dad, he always says to um, always ask for help. And he um, always tells us to never give up and keep working at it. I think that's really good advice that he gave us. <laughs> Yeah. So just uh, Alicia, um, see this as an uncle that you have not met yet, just asking you some questions. So just breathe in, uh, and be like, this is a, a, a new uncle from the Caribbean, right? And, and so he has an accent that's new to you. And so just just relax and say that um, that way. But thank you. Um, thank you both. President and Mrs. Jenkins, are there any concerns from your perspective? about the evolution of the black family. Any concerns about the evolution of the black family? Mm. Let me see. I think. Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. I know we were talking. I think as long as we continue to have that introspective look on, you know, to be successful on how can I continue to better myself? Um, I think that as a family unit, if everyone is monitoring how can they continue to improve upon, you know, their current state, then I think the evolution of the black family will continue to progress in a forward uh, movement positively if we are all doing the work, sort of say, on ourselves instead of quickly, you know, passing the buck or finding fault in someone else. Mm -hmm. So no concerns <laughs> at the moment. Could you re repeat the question for me, Doc? Y yes, the question was, are there any concerns from your perspective about the evolution of the Black family? Any concerns? Hmm. No, you know, as, as we've been talking about uh, throughout this, this conversation, uh, I think as the Black family uh, evolves and there are um, different elements that are brought into uh, who the black family is and, and what it looks like today. Uh, I think that our ideas and our acceptance of that has to e evolve also. 
I think try to take where we are now as a community, as a people, as a country, and try and tie that to, I think, some ideas that uh, may not be best suited, I think would bring more strain and stress um, into the situation that is unnecessary. Um, one of the things that, that I'm always cognizant of um, is I always want to challenge us um, to understand um, at the core of what we do is the next generation and how we raise them, how we educate them, how we nurture them is important. And I don't want us to see us ever take steps backwards in that aspect of it. Whether you are fortunate to have a two-parent household, uh, whether you are being raised by a, a single parent, um, you know, there is still value added that contributes to the success of our young uh, uh, next generation of uh, uh, students. And so I don't, I don't have any major concerns. Uh, I definitely just want to make sure that we don't put ourselves in a in a box, so to speak, on this this unrealistic concept of what a black family is, uh, because to me that is dangerous and it's unfair to so many single parents who are out there working hard every day and say, yes, I am doing a terrific job and I'm raising my family well, but you 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 try to compare me to this 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 uh, perception that is not realistic across the board. And so I would I would just encourage us to be cautious about when we do that and when we engage in those types of conversations. Good, good. Um, Ashley and Alicia, what, what are your ages again? I'm 15, I'm 14. So have you already started thinking about what you want to do when you grow up? I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to pose this question and whoever is prepared to answer it, if you um, please do so. What are some of your future goals? I, for me personally, my future goal, I, I want to do a lot of things at, at once. Um, I want to be a doctor, a vet. Um, I also want to be a businesswoman, an entrepreneur. And then maybe later in life, I might want to, you know, be a congresswoman, but we'll see. So I, I like to have a plan for my future, but I also want to help my community and where I come from. I don't ever want to, like, leave people behind. So I always want to be giving to charities and helping my community and helping the people grow in those communities. Thank you. So I probably was right earlier when I said your family is growing. I assume some more animals may be coming into the um, household, right? Wait, no, 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 please, please, no more, no more animals, no more animals. Right. What about you, Alicia? Any thoughts about your future goals there? I think I'm, I'm still um, deciding on what I want to do because I'm not sure, like, I'm not pinpointing what I want to do because I still have like at least four more years to decide. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what what do you what kinds of things um, tend to excite you? Um, I like sketching, and um, I really uh, like uh, to look. I like uh, shopping, so I think club. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, looking at different styles of clothes. So, like maybe creating a clothing brand. It's what I want to do. As you said, you you ha you have some time, so that's good. So, follow up question: Who inspires you? They, I see them work hard every single day, especially they work hard to get to the positions that they are in. 
So it's always, I'd say it's always really good. My parents are a really good role model for me to look at. Okay. So see, 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 Doc, you know, I am, this is, this, to, to me, this is, this is what it, it, it's all about, right? It's about um, doing more to expose our, our young people to things that as a child growing up, I was not exposed to, uh, that I just didn't have the you know, opportunity uh, to do these, these types of things. I mean, when I was 14 and 15 growing up, uh, you know, I wasn't thinking about becoming a you know, veterinarian or, uh, you know, opening up my own fashion to, to design shop and all of these things and, and so forth. It was it was much different. I mean, we were out uh, doing things that, you know, 14 year old boys do, um, which was getting get into. Um, and that didn't make my mother any less uh, better parent than I am. Uh, she just had she had right because she was a single mother um, and so but but when you are able to invest in your children and do it in a way that you see them grow without influencing your body is important and I think that is significant for any family especially for the African-American family. Yes, yes, that's that's what it's all about. And um, um, young ladies, I'm going to ask you the last question so you all could breathe a little bit. At least I'll go back to your parents for um, a, a little while. What is your favorite activity to do and why? I like to do. Um, I think uh, my top three would be go I also like to you know, start reading random articles about things. Um, I say I the last thing I like to do is not many probably not many kids my age like to do this, but I like to learn in my free time. So I go on Khan Academy and just catch them one math or science that I'm doing in my class further myself, so I know what I'm doing. I say those are my favorite activities. Yeah, thank you. Do you have any? What about you, Alicia? Uh, I could actually think I want to, but I go kart riding. We get very competitive. The <laughs> feed <laughs> Yeah. Good. No, um, President and Mrs. Jenkins, um, how do you see the perceived weakening of the Black family impacting the problems of the Black community? How do you see the perceived weakening of the Black family impacting the problems faced by the Black community? That's a great question. So how do, how do we perceive the impact of the black family the weakening of the um the um black family the perceived weakening let me put that how do you see the perceived weakening of the black family right i think i would have to reinforce what i mentioned earlier about the importance of that home base to me that's important in establishing that and so if that isn't there for that family unit as far as motivating and encouraging each other at home then I think that carries out into the world. You know, if, if a person isn't receiving that love and that nurturing, that support system at home, it's going to affect the black community out. You know, as as a whole. What you said? Yeah. Let, let me let, let me take just just a little different spin on it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that there is an an obligation to push back on this negative narrative that has. Um, been thrust upon the the uh, black family. Um, uh, this 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 notion that um, uh, you know absentee fathers and, and you know you know dads that that are in prison who don't care about their kids, uh, seventy percent of households being um, 
uh, headed by single women. Um, you know, listen, those things occur across all ethnic groups. But for some reason, they have been used to either say this is why the the black community is in um, uh, hardship or why uh, there is, uh, you know, some high incarceration rates of you know, young black males and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, my 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 position is that we understand there are challenges within the African-American community. And we want to do all we can to continue to build up and strengthen our black families. Yes, that is important. Um, I, I think it's important to take a deeper dive into some of the actual data. And so when you talk about 70% of African-American households being led by black women, um, there are so many other layers of those data that never come to, to the surface. Right. <clears throat> so so maybe that African-American woman husband is deceased. Right. Maybe there was a a amicable split, but the the father is still intertwined into the children's lives. There are there are so many other pieces to that. And so uh, I, I think taking our voice and our opportunity and our example to strengthen our communities, whether they are headed by dual parents or there is a, a single parent or it is a blended family, um, I think there is an opportunity for us to continue to drive that narrative and help folks understand that we are not monolithic. And so therefore, um, uh, what could be working for one African-American family, may not be working for the next African-American family. But at the end of the day, what I wanna see more is that we continue to invest and support and encourage our young people. And that's where Coppin State University comes into play. Uh, I, I think even as an institution, we have a responsibility and an opportunity to provide that that in loco parentes type of philosophy for those young men and women who don't get what we would want them to get from home as far as a nurturing and supportive and encouraging environment. And we can provide that to them at our institution. So, you know, those that I'll just I'll just say that those are some of the points that I would throw out for the uh, conversation and to know that every family situation is different. There is value in the black family across the board. And we have to take every opportunity to drive that narrative of, away from the stereotypical uh, perspective that mainstream America has given about the black family. Um, President Jenkins, continuing with that thought a little bit, expanding <clears throat> it a little bit. Um, I'm going to ask you this question. What do you um, see as Coppin's role, be as specific as you can, if you if you would, in celebrating black family life specifically? Again, let me let me say. When when free slaves uh, started sending their children to our institutions, there was an agreement with them and the HBCUs. And it was a in loco parentis agreement that they would bring their students to us and we would act in place of the parent, because that's what in loco parentis means, is that we would feed them, we would educate them, we would protect them, we would nurture them. And when the parent came back to get them, they would be better off than when they first brought them to us. I think it is important for us to still hold on to that philosophy. It is important for us to still see ourselves as in place of the parent. We have a obligation to treat our students as if they were ours, and yet we in, invest in their, in their knowledge, in their growth, in their uh, um, uh, overall success, in their, in their happiness. We hold them accountable. And, and so 
uh, I, I think that we can serve as that family unit, those parents to students who unfortunately may not have, have gotten that. But I think also we can showcase ourselves as that example that elevates the black family every opportunity we get. And using examples, just like you are doing today, right? Doc, listen, my, 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 I, am, I am very fortunate. I, I am married up. Uh, I have a beautiful family. I am very blessed, right? Um, I want to be a good example, not only for my daughters, but for anyone who comes in contact with my family. Because what you see here is authentic. But I also, in the same breath, don't want anyone within the Black community or external to the Black community to believe that this is the only model of a successful Black family. There, there are multiple models out there that work according to people's needs and their situations. This is just one great example, but there are many out there. And I think we as a institution, as a as an HBCU, we have wonderful examples in our faculty and, and in our staff. And as we come together as a community, that too can be celebrated as what that new contemporary family looks like that you asked me about earlier. Thank you. And this final question is, I'm placing this one entirely in your hands. Um, is there anything that I did not ask that you would like the viewers to know? Girls, anything? I, I, I know Ashley has something. I see it, see it uh, <laughs> written all over um, her face. Um, would you like us to come back to you? I, I see you have something to say. I'll think, I'll think about it, I'll think about it. It's kind okay, of Mrs. Jenkins. <laughs> I think this is a very interesting discussion, very good, thorough discussion. Uh, so I don't think I have anything to add. We're excited to be here. Alicia. No, I'm good. <laughs> well, let me, let me say, Doc, listen, I, I, again, I think we need to do more uh, opportunities like this, right? Create more platforms for us to look at what that contemporary Black family looks like, uh, how we continue to work through generational changes, um, how we continue to use our institution um, and the first family as an, an example, um, but not the only example. Um, but, you know, just having these conversations to get a, a, a glimpse into what life is like for us or to hear what my, my daughters think. Um, to me, that is important. And so I want to thank you for this, this, this opportunity to, to share a little bit of who we are, not only with the entire Coppin family, but with all of those supporters and friends of Coppin who have uh, uh, tuned in today. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, are you ready for me, Ashley? We'll give you the, um, the last word. Oh, um, mm -hmm. I, I think, I don't know, I think, I think we're good. I think you did everything. <laughs> <laughs> good, 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 good. Let me um, say on behalf of the um, committee, it was an absolute de um, delight getting to know um, each and every one of you a little better. We, um, you joined us during peculiar times. And so uh, many of us have not got the opportunity to meet um, each of you. We hope that this will pass in the next um, few months so we can safely um, gather and celebrate um, in person. But we thank God for technology, which still allows us uh, um, to come together and to share with, with each other. And um, again, on behalf of the, um, the committee, I would like to thank you. And also um, to, um, tell the young ladies, we have um, different things planned for the entire month. And there's some things that you may find um, interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I invite you to, um, to take time
to join us in those other forums as well. It's not all serious stuff. There's some fun <laughs> things. I mean, we have planned things um, about um, different foods, how to eat, um, eat healthy um, and still have tasty, um, tasty meals. I know, um, Ashley, you talk about becoming a, a, a businesswoman of sorts. We have um, a, a session on black family businesses. We talk about um, health, of, uh, an array of things. And we are hoping that at the end of the month, have some fun, have some um, kind of game. We're still um, working, uh, working it out. So there are other opportunities for us to come together. And um, President, I did um, honor your request um, as far as um, time is concerned. And so um, I know that I would not be responsible for you be, um, being late to your next appointment. But um, thank you for being generous in your in your responses as well. And for those others who are listening on, um, even as we end this segment of the celebrations, we hope that you will remain with us for the next 15 minutes. And as we focus on taking a moment to engage in, in self-care, where we begin this um, semester, the month of celebrations with some breathing techniques for releasing stress and feelings of anxiety. But before we transitioning into that, um, please um, join me in a moment of silence to honor our ancestors as we celebrate Black History Month. Thank you so very much. Again, thank you um, Jenkins family, and I look forward um, to seeing um, you again. Um, be blessed each of you. Ashley and Alicia, I wish you the very best as you continue to grow and develop in the healthy environment that your parents have created for you. And I, I hope that um, with your dad clearly says he doesn't want the home to become like Dr. Doolittle's home. <laughs> but I know he will still create opportunities for you to pursue your, um, your dreams. May God richly bless each and every one of you. Right? At this time, um, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me as we end this session with the Jenkins family to introduce you to Dr. J Vanessa Jackson, who is an assistant professor and director of dance at Coppin, as well as a member of the African American History Month Committee. We know that we're a little early, but um, Dr. Jackson, I assume um, you can take us away. Yes, yes, that was fabulous. Thank you for allowing us to enter into your house, into your home, and experience you in a very authentic way. Today, we're going to take time to release stress, honor ourselves, and hopefully to increase our bandwidth. Science has taught us that as we travel through our day, that our bandwidth diminish because of all the challenges that we face, all the moments in our lives. And today I want to share with you just a moment of meditation, of deep breathing, simple techniques that you can use in your home, in your classroom, just deep breathing. And the first thing that comes to mind is whenever you are upset, your mama and your grandmama said, breathe, baby. Just breathe and release. And that's what I'm hoping we'll do today. We will simply learn how to take a moment to breathe and to exhale anything that does not bring us peace, love, and joy, just to release it out into the universe, to allow it to escape our bodies, and hopefully to bring us peace. So as we begin, just simply sit back in your chair or feel free to lay down wherever you're comfortable. and begin to 
monitor your breathing pattern. Focus in on inhaling and then gently exhaling. And again, just inhale through your nose. Watch the breath come in and then ever so gently begin to exhale through your nose. And as you exhale, soften your shoulders, sit back, relax, and let's inhale one more time. Inhale through your nose, and then gently begin to exhale through your nose. And I just want you to be mindful that if your brain flips back and forth, you're unable to tame it. It's called mind wandering. And this is normal when you haven't had a moment to really appreciate your breath and using your breath to control your mind. So don't worry about it. It's not a biggie. Don't worry about it. Each time that you, your mind begins to wander, just focus back on your breathing. Just simple breathing in and gently exhaling. Now I want to move on to just a little um, more advanced technique. This time we're going to inhale through our nose and then we will gently exhale through our mouth. And each time that you inhale, feel your belly expand. And then when you exhale through your mouth, just release anything that does not bring you peace, love, and joy. Just release it, let it go. Science has artists also taught us that all of these conflicting emotions stay in our bodies and they cause disease or disease. And so we want to release that. Just let it go. Anxiety, stress, just let it go. Release it. So let's begin. Inhale through your nose. And then ever so gently begin to exhale through your mouth. Release and relax. And let's do it again. Inhale through your nose. And then gently exhale through your mouth. Release anything that does not serve you well. It might have been that you were stressed from the snow. Just release it. Inhale one more time. Inhale through your nose. And then ever, ever so gently begin to exhale through your mouth, releasing anything that does not serve you well. And you may wonder, well, why do we meditate? Well, this is what we know science has taught us, is that it lowers our blood pressure. It builds confidence. It allows us to tap into our center, into our heart. It allows us to appreciate ourselves and others. It allows us to build meaningful relationships with each other. And it allows us to bring more awareness in our decision-making process. This process takes five minutes. So whenever you find yourself just overwhelmed, close your door, inhale through your nose, and then release anything that does not serve you well. And then 
you simply sit with that moment with the quietness that surrounds you just for a moment. Just for a moment. And now I'd like to move on to the more advanced level of meditation. And this is where we pause between our inhalation and our exhalation. And it's in that pause that you find the peace. I often say it's like a freeze frame. It's where you freeze and everything around you seems to disappear. And you can take time out for yourself for some self healing, some self love, some self worth. So let's gently begin and remember the mind wanders. It's fine because we're trying to be mindful and mindfulness is being in the present moment without criticism and judgment. So I say that again, we want to be mindful in how we speak to each other, how we interact throughout the day, how we conduct ourselves and mindfulness is being present in this moment without criticism and judgment of ourselves and of others. So let's begin. Inhale through your nose and simply pause. And then gently exhale through your mouth. Just let it go. You have the power to decide what to hold on to or what to release. Make that choice meaningful. And we do everything in threes. So let's do this again. Gently inhale through your nose and pause for a moment, finding the peace and exhale, releasing anything that does not serve you well. Soften your shoulders, release the muscles in your back, release the muscles in your face, just soften become like a cotton ball, releasing. And one more time. Let's gently inhale through your nose and pause for a moment and ever so gently exhale. Then listening to the music, just sit in the space, create the space for calmness. And as we begin to end our meditation session, we'll do a visualization. And this is in honor of our ancestors. You will see yourself standing on a mountaintop with a river beneath, a waterfalls, and as you scan the land, you rec recognize the beauty of where we come from, of who we are as a people. So in your mind's eye, where you dream, just take a moment to see yourself standing on top of a mountaintop, looking down at a waterfall, flowing to a river from a land that your ancestors were born. And at this moment, when you stand there, Give thanks for their carriage.
for the Black family. and for their love. Honor them in whatever way you would like to as you stand on this mountaintop. As we say, Sankofa means to remember from where you've come so that you know where you're going. Just take about 30 seconds to appreciate those who came before us. And as we close our meditation, We send our gratitude. So take a moment to inhale through your nose and to send gratitude to someone who is in need. Thank them, embrace them, let them know that you care. And let's inhale again. And this time, exhale loving kindness to everyone that's on this call. Mindfulness is about loving kindness towards ourselves and towards each other. Now let's take a moment to be grateful that we're willing to do the work to honor ourselves. Inhale through your nose and send love kindness to yourself as you begin to gently exhale. And at the end of our meditation, we say namaste, which simply means, I see the light in you, and I am hopeful that you see the light in me, and that as you travel and journey, that you look for the light in every person because that is how we're connected. We're all connected as one big family through the light of the God of your understanding and through Mother Earth. So I say to you, Namaste. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Vanessa Jackson, um, thank you so very much for this. Um, I assume that we will be having some more uh, meditation um, sessions throughout Black History Month. Sure, yeah, absolutely. If anybody's interested, please just email me at vanjackson at coffin.edu and um, I'll set up some more meditation sessions. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the first um, segment uh, in a series of um, activities for Black History Month. Thank you for joining us. And please remember to check the, um, the website for a variety of activities that we have planned for the month. Um, please continue to check it regularly as we um, still we would still be adding some activities and updating some of the information that's already posted. Thank you. Be safe. Live well.